Prince of Peace, Counselor, Merciful, Son of God, Lord of hosts, Conqueror, Coming King, and ever-living God, I extol you, I extol you, you're high above the earth, all creation shout your worth, I extol I extol you, my Jehovah, I extol you, I extol you, Lord, I extol you, you're high above the earth, all creation shout your worth, I extol you, I extol you, my Jehovah. thank God that no matter what we do or don't do, Jesus is already on the highest place. That no amount of praising Him can put Him higher and no amount of sinning can bring Him lower. So what's the purpose of this song? We place you in the highest place. It's where we are acknowledging that He's in the highest place. And we're saying, Lord, in my life, we surrender everything. And we worship at your feet. It's a cold morning, and I would suspect that none of us would like to go outside and walk around on the ground in bare feet. Correct? But before we're ready to put our shoes on, in a sense, to go and walk in this world, we need to come and take our shoes off in, with that kind of an idea. Not that, this, not that this location is a holy ground, per se, but because we're in the presence of God, it's symbolically taking off our shoes. Lord, I surrender everything to you, that anything that I do, it's because of you. Anything that I accomplish, any place I go, it's because of you, and you clothe me. You prepare me, you equip me. The 
as we sing this again, can we, can we do it just afresh, making it our prayer and say, Lord, here I am. Take the cares of the morning, the cares of the week, the cares of life, the responsibilities, the joys, the upsets, whatever they are. And take them off the high place. Just clear all of those areas of our lives and just say, Lord, those are not where I want these other things. Lord, you are the one I want in the high place in my life to govern every other aspect.
at your feet, oh Lord, it's a most high place. In your presence, Lord, I sing you your face. I sing you your face. Down at your feet, oh Lord, it's the most high place. In your presence, Lord, we sing your face. I sing you your face. I am only no greater honor than to bow and kneel before your throne. I'm amazed at your glory and grace. By your mercy, O oh Lord, I live to worship you. There is no I am only greater honor than to bow and be for your throne. I'm amazed at your glory and grace. By your mercy, O oh Lord, I live to worship you. Lord, there's no higher calling and no greater honor than to bow. At your glory embraced by your mercy, O oh Lord, I live to worship you. O oh Lord, I live to worship you. O oh Lord, I live to worship you. Let the temple be filled with His glory, and let the courts be filled with His praise. Let us worship the Lord. in you today, Lord.
I have found the joy no gun can tell how its waves of glory roll. It is like a great overflowing well, springing up within my soul. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and has never yet been told. Yes, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, and the heart has never yet been told. Joy, unspeakable joy. And overflowing well, no tongue can tell. Oh, joy, unspeakable joy, it rises in my soul, never lets me go. Unspeakable joy and overflowing well, no tongue can tell. Joy, unspeakable joy, it rises in my soul, never lets me go. Bless you, Jesus. Oh, bless you, Lord. Thank God. Bless his name. You can go ahead and be seated if you like. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I feel like I have something to say. Um, <clears throat> the joy God was speaking of, it's truly a blessing. And I feel this season, or even in people's lives, as they go through sickness and, and, and different episodes in their life where there's a lot of sadness, and people lose their joy. So even those who are in Christ can lose their joy. And, and if you don't mind, I, I feel like I should pray for that. Mm. Lord, I just thank you for the joy you give. It is our strength. As you have spoken to Nehemiah, Lord, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes, Jesus. And that, uh, Lord, I just lift up people who've lost their joy because of different situations. And I just pray, God, because it's a, a gift from you, that, Lord, you would gift them with this joy. I pray for those, Lord, that haven't met you yet, that they will meet you, and, and that that joy will be such a, a, a convincing that, Lord, that they did the right thing. You would fill people with joy this season, God, where they may have lost it because of situations out of their control. And we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Uh, let's turn to the word, shall we? Let's stand together. Take our Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5, and we're picking it up in verse 13. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. 
Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And, and the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Church, this is the very word of God. And again, Lord, we thank you for your word. Higher than any other word. It is the truth. I thank you, Lord, that um, it's not one of many so-called truths. I thank you that this is the one and the only truth, and you have, you have blessed us by giving it to us. So we submit ourselves to the authority of this word and say, Jesus, by your spirit, have your way in us. Give us understanding, I pray. May May the cross be lifted high. May Jesus be lifted high. May the knowledge of who you are be lifted high. In your great and mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. The title of my message this morning is Jesus, Lord at dot, dot, dot. We have the people of Israel, they're ready to go into the promised land. They have just crossed the Jordan River shortly ago. They are on now the west side of the Jordan River. They're, they're on the Jericho side of the Jordan River. Not at Jericho, but they're, they're close to Jericho. And here Joshua, as he was by Jericho, he's uh, no doubt praying considering what is, what's my next step? What's, what do we do next? And I thank God that he leads us. He's leading the people of Israel. He, he didn't say, now cross the river. He'd given those instructions back in chapter 3, 4. He says, cross the river. When you get across the river, here's what you're to do. And spoke about circumcision and the like. And I'm not going to get into all, those, into all of those details, but I want us to realize that God is telling them what to do, when to do it, and where to do it. And now that they have crossed the Jordan River, you've got to wonder, what, what do we do next? Do we just wait here? And I can tell you this, from the Word of God, and I've learned from personal experience in accordance with the Word of God, that until the Lord gives another directive... Go with the last thing that he said. Be obedient to his word. And if he, if he tells us to do something more, then walk with that. But until that happens, and unless that happens, go with the last thing that he, the last correct, instructive, the last command that he gave. Now, now when I say new commands, I don't mean any, something added to his word. I mean uh, in your situation, all right? As the Lord gives us, awareness of what he's doing and what, what he wants us to do next. Joshua could have sat down with, with the different commanders of the army and said, here's what we, what, what we should look at doing. This has been my experience, so, so let's draft up some plans and get ready to fight. But he doesn't do that. Here he is, he's near Jericho considering what's going to take place. Lord, I don't know what's next. We've done what you've asked us to do. Now what? And while he is standing there, he looks and, and a man is coming toward him. Now I want you to get a, an idea of this. Visualize it. There's a man approaching him and the man has his sword drawn. He does not announce himself or his intentions. But Joshua calls out to him, and he says, are you for us or for our enemies? And what did this man say? No. Wrong question. He tells him, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. And I love what he says next. And now I have come. I have come. And as soon as 
the commander of the Lord's army, speaks this word. Joshua does what he, the only thing that he can do. He falls on his face before him and worships. He, he says, what would you say to your servants? He's saying, I'm all ears. I don't have a plan. I'm not, cons- I'm, I'm not a, presuming to know anything here. And he bows himself, a sign of complete submission to his authority. And, and it's not just submission to his authority. It's not just him subjecting himself. It says that, that he worships him. Had this been any other being, they would have said, any any angel, they would have said, get up. Don't worship me. Do not worship me. But that is not given to Joshua, is he? Is it? And there's a reason for that. It's because this is Jesus. The pre-incarnate Jesus. Incarnate means God becoming man. God in the flesh, incarnation, pre-incarnation, pre-incarnate means before God became a man in the person of Jesus, that Jesus would on occasion appear to different individuals throughout history. And we see a similar picture here, a similar presentation as would be seen prior to this and also would be seen once after this, at least in this, in this same kind of a picture. How is the commander of the Lord's army approaching Joshua? He has his sword drawn. You'll find that two other times in the Old Testament with the sword drawn where it's not spoken about a mere man, just as an individual. You'll find it in Numbers chapter 22. This is where Balaam, just a short time ago, like just a few weeks ago, has been summoned by Balak, the king of Moab. He wants to destroy the people of Israel. And at that point, they were on the other side of the Jordan River. You get the picture? Jordan River, on the east side, on the right side as you look at it, was a place called Shittim. And that's where the Israelites were camped. Moab, the king of Moab, wanted to destroy them. He considered them a threat. So he summoned for Balaam to come and curse them, a prophet for hire. Balaam comes, and when Balaam came, the Lord said, don't go, you're not permitted to go. And One thing leads to another, and Finally, with, with a third envoy coming to get Balaam, he says, listen, I want you, he really wants you to come. So the Lord tells Balaam, you can go, but do only what I tell you to do. Well, Balaam says, okay, I can leave, I can go with you. But I can only speak what the Lord tells me to speak. But in his heart, he had something else in mind, and the Lord knows the heart. And as he goes, riding on his donkey... We're told that the donkey stops and, and there, the angel of the Lord stood to oppose him. And then Balaam pushed the donkey on more and then finally when they got to a narrow place, a, a, a basically a, a, a ravine, rocks on both sides, just enough for, for them to pass through that, that the angel of the Lord stood before Balaam and his donkey with his sword drawn. And at this, the the donkey leans against the wall trying to resist Balaam, crushes his ankle, and then sits down underneath him. Balaam gets off and starts beating his donkey. And the Lord put words, human voice, in the donkey's mouth. Why are you doing this to me? And Balaam talks back to the donkey as as if it's the most normal thing. (laughs) Well, because you stopped. Have I ever done this before? Have I ever disobeyed you before? Well, no. It's it's pretty bad when a donkey is reasoning logic with us and putting us in our right place. 
But you see how the angel of the Lord is standing before Balaam with his sword drawn. When you see the angel of the Lord spoken about in the scriptures, it is Jesus. You'll see it again in 1 Chronicles chapter 22. David, he's taken, uh, he's, he's numbered the people. But it, it was against the Lord's command. He didn't seek God's face. He was looking to bolster his own ego. And as a result, the Lord brought judgment and we're told that there was between the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusites. Right there and, and between that and Jerusalem, the city, he sees the angel of the Lord. And, and how is the angel of the Lord depicted there? With his sword drawn. The angel of the Lord is spoken of several times throughout the Old Testament. This is Jesus, the angel of the Lord, over and over again. And now, here he is, Jesus, appearing in the form of a man, but only having taken on the form for that specific interaction. He didn't join himself with, in humani with the humanity at that point. And he tells Joshua, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. The army of the Lord is, the army is, is Tzava, Tzava. And, and it means hosts. So if you read in the scriptures, the Lord of hosts, that's Tzavaot. The plural. This, this is indicating that, that a, a numbering, a group, a crowd, an army. That Jesus commands not just the heavenly angels, the warriors, at his behest. But all throughout creation. Everything is subservient to him. Everything. He is Lord of all. So he gives, the Lord gives instruction, he gives the tactic, he gives the strategy to Joshua for what they're to do in order to, to conquer the land in their beginning at Jericho. Formidable, the foremost city. And it's tightly shut up. Why is it so tightly shut up? We read about it in chapter 2 that Rahab tells the two spies that had gone in the city is tightly shut up for fear of you because of your God. We have heard what your God did to the Egyptians. And how long ago was that? That was 40 years ago. We've heard what you've done, what your God has done. And they, they learned about Sihon. They've learned about other kings just recently. They've heard about no doubt about Moab trying to do what they've done. Go and march around the city. Seven times, once a day. And on the seventh day, seven times, don't make a sound. The priests leading the circumference, the circling. And on the seventh day, seven times, and at the end of the seventh time around, the priests will blow the shofar, the yoval, it's called the, the, the ram's horn. When the walls come down, they're to run straight up, every one of them. Church, how do those walls come down? Here, here's what I want us to envision, if we can. Jesus is here, and he says, I am the commander of... The Lord's army. He's basically saying, you're not the one fighting here. I am the commander of the Lord's army. And so you do what I tell you to do, and then I'm going to dispatch my hosts, and they'll take care of the rest. And here's what I envision. I can't tell you it's for certain, but here's what I envision. There's a myriad of of angels all on the inside wall of Jericho and every one of them hands on the wall ready to push it outward as soon as they hear that trumpet blast. They hear the trumpet blast 
And each angel then pushes, and the wall all around comes down, with the exception of the angel that was standing at Rahab's house that kept that section of the wall from crumbling, from the sheer force of the, of the ripping apart of bricks and so on, and stone around both sides and the rest of that, that circumference of the wall. Do we realize that angels are at work around this church? And Joshua, he's told... Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. Where do we hear that before this? Where did we hear that before? I don't mean this morning, but where do you hear that in the Word of God? Where do you read that? I heard a couple. Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Moses at the, the bush that appeared to be burning but was not consumed. And the angel of the Lord speaks to him from out of the midst of that fire. Moses, don't come any nearer. The place where you're standing is holy. So Moses removed his shoes and worshiped the Lord. The angel of the Lord there with Moses, the angel of the Lord here with Joshua, the commander of the, of the armies of heaven. And I want us to, to recognize that, that Jesus is working a plan. That this plan of redemption has been in place since before the foundation of the world. And even what was taking place with the, the nation of Israel getting ready to come into the promised land and conquering one place after another, it was by the leading of the Lord. Bringing them into the promises that he had made to their forefather Abraham. Telling Abraham, I'm giving you this land. Everywhere you place your foot, I'm going to give it to you. Dan to Beersheba, from the river to the sea. Church, the only aspect from the river to the sea that anyone's having is Israel is going to have from the river to the sea. And more. If you look at the, the ge geographical uh, boundaries of the land promised to Abraham, it it dwarfs other nations in the Middle East today. So that when Jesus returns as, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, could be as soon as seven years from now. And, and I say that to remind us that Jesus could return today, and if that was the case, it would be seven years away that Jesus would come at the end of the seven-year tribulation, as mentioned in Daniel chapter 9, Revelation throughout the entire book. And other places. Jeremiah speaks of it in Isaiah. And when he returns, he's going he's to then give the land that was promised to Israel in its entirety. More than just from the river to the sea. I thank God that he's a God who promises and keeps his promises. But even as Joshua was leading them into this conquest... Joshua serves even by namesake. It's, it's the same name in Hebrew as Jesus. Jesus and Joshua in, in English, they share the same word, the same name in Hebrew. Jesus giving us a picture. This is what I'm going to do when I come. From this point, about 1,400 years later. 1,400 years later from this conquest, he would come and he's going to demonstrate similarly what he did here and what he showed over and over again throughout the, the history recorded for us in the Old Testament. He involves his angels over and over and over again. And do you know that angels were created before the rest of, of the material universe? In, in Job chapter 38, would you turn there for a moment? Job, if, if you know where Psalms is, just turn left. It's the book just before Psalms. Job 38.
Job has been suffering for quite some time, and he's, he's basically been demanding an audience with God. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? Who did this when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? This is speaking about when it says the stars sang together, the sons of God. Those are synonyms of angels. In, in the first chapter of Job 1 and verse 6, it all the sons of God gathered together. They appeared before the Lord and amongst them appeared Satan. Where have you been? What have you been doing? But the sons of God. It's another, another phrase for angels. And we're told here that the angels were there after God created them and they were there watching, singing. And they shouted for joy as an audience, as it were, as God said, let there be, and light appeared, let there be, and, and dry ground appeared, let there be, and so on. All of the events of creation enumerated for us in Genesis chapter 1, and the angels are like, yes, praise God, woo, shouting for joy. We're reserved here in the Maritimes. We're reserved here in Carleton County. <laughs> it's hard for us to, to picture that. We, we think in, in more conservative tones, more reserved tones, don't we? But church, when angels shout for joy, I'm certain they shout for joy. And it's not just limited to when God created, but when God recreates, when God makes a person a new creation in Jesus Christ. When Jesus spoke about the lost sheep, the, the 99 are there, one's lost, the the shepherd leaves the 99, goes and finds the one. And he says, come, rejoice with me because my lost sheep, that which was lost has been found. A woman who had 10 coins loses one, sweeps everything, moves everything out of the way and finally found, finds that one. Celebrate with me, that which was lost is found. So there is great joy among the angels of heaven at one sinner. One sinner. that is found. Wow. Heaven is a joyous place. Heaven is a joyous place. Jesus, we see His power, we see His majesty, we see His strength, we see what He, just by the very display of His presence, the, the, the reaction, the response that, that he commands. What happens when Joshua hears, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord? What does he do? He's not told, worship me. What does he do? He says, what would you say to me? Speak. And he falls down on his face and he worships the Lord. See, the Lord was going before him. The Lord was, was giving him the direction. The Lord was giving him his word. I'd like for us to go ahead to Luke chapter 2. In those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each one to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, 
because he was of the house and lineage of David. He went to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. This, this angel and then joined with other hosts of heaven are going to give a message of good news that a Savior has been born. And you'll hear some say that, can I just put an aside here for a second, put in a little asterisk, 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 is that an X or a K? Anyway, you know, one of those star-shaped note holders, what is it? K, asterisk, asterisk, all right, little asterisk here. You, you may hear it or, or read or have heard it said that the reason God chose shepherds is because they were despised in Israel and because uh, their testimony wouldn't even be uh, considered acceptable in a court of law. That's hogwash. That, that goes on, on one or two persons' uh, ideas back about 30 or 40 years ago that they picked up from Galileo and then they picked up from another philosopher and it doesn't have anything to do with, with Jewish shepherds and it was just one comment out of one person's mouth about how they felt about shepherds, not reflective of anything more than that. Church, when you look throughout, when you look throughout the scriptures, how are shepherds always, 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 true shepherds, how are they always portrayed? How are they always spoken about? Every single time with honor, endearment, positively every single time even to the point that Jesus said I am the in John 10 I am the good shepherd now what were despised were crooked shepherds but shepherds on a whole were not despised all right do you notice there's one angel one angel He appeared to them, the Lord's glory shines around them, meaning that angel and the shepherds. He hasn't said a thing yet, and what is the response of the shepherds? Fear. But not just any old fear. This is fear on steroids. They're filled with great fear. Why? Because this is an angel of the Lord. Not the angel of the Lord, an angel of the Lord. One of the hosts of heaven. One angel, and what's their response? They were terrified. This is one of the many of the angels of the army of the Lord that Jesus himself commands. Here is the Lord of glory now. He, he confines himself to the space of a womb. Confining himself to a human body, a baby at that. A zygote at that. Conceived by the Holy Spirit. And there is Jesus now, introducing himself, interjecting himself into humanity. But he has not lost his divinity. He's not laid aside his divinity. Hear the song, Silent Night, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. But not just in a... In a romantic kind of a way Jesus Lord at thy birth literally he is Lord who came and was born among men and here are angels now the glory of the Lord shines around them 
So much so that the shepherds are terrified. And here is one of the greatest things that we can hear in the Word of God. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Why? Why don't be afraid? For behold, I bring you good news of of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Deliverer. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Promise Keeper. Unto you is born this day in the city of David one who is going to save you from your sins. Unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ, what? The Lord. The Lord. He, he's basically saying, unto you is born this day, unto you is born this day, I still can't get my head around it, the angel that is, right? Is a Savior who is Christ, my boss. My commander. Do you get this? You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. What are they saying? Glory to God. This baby born in Bethlehem. Glory to God. Look what he's done. Look what he's done. The one who has formed the universe, speaking it into existence. The one who has promised himself as the covenant for the people has come. A Savior. He doesn't just say a Savior who is Christ. He wants them to know this is the commander of us. Glory to God in the highest. It's cute, church. It's cute when when our kids do a, a Christmas pageant, a play, and then you've got the angels. And they're usually three, four, five, six years old. And they're always girls, right? Aren't they? But occasionally, a guy might say, oh, I want to be an angel too. Or maybe you're short on this or that. And so you will make them an angel because they have no speaking parts. Unless you've got the one that's saying that and then you've got everyone else in the highest. And they've got the halos. They're, they're in their white robes. They've, they've got the bristleboard wings with the, with the gold frock around it, the, the garland, uh, sparkly garland. Have you been there? Uh, how many angels... How many former angels in the, in the congregation? Come on, don't be shy. How many former angels? <laughs> as cute as you were, I'm certain. Church, we don't need our little preschoolers playing angels. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that we do not get the picture. But I want us to understand the angels... For for depicting in pageants, from now on, I think there should be a new code. You need to go to the nearest gym, find bodybuilders, and they need to come in in full garb and swords exposed, drawn. These were not sissies. These angels were not feminine. Church, when when God sent Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden and and He had cherubim placed as guards with a flaming sword placed there at the entrance to the garden. These angelic beings. I can tell you, they were not looking like little uh, diapered babies with wings and a bow and arrow. These were majestic creatures. Fearsome! Awesome! The shepherds were what? Terrified! 
we stand and serve at the pleasure of our Lord. And we stand before you today full of great joy. Because he's done something incredible. He's brought salvation for you. It's our honor to glorify God in bringing this declaration to you today. Do you know, think about this for a moment. If you go back just one chapter and one of these angels, we're not, I don't know if he was there amongst those hosts or if he was the one making the initial declaration. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy. I don't know if this was him. But this is one of the angels. Gabriel. Mighty man of God. Zechariah, he goes into the temple. It's, he's chosen to serve at the altar of incense at this particular occasion. And while he's there, an angel appears to him. Look at verse 12. When, the, when the, an angel of the Lord appears standing on the right side of the altar of incense, Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and what? Fear fell upon him. He didn't look at the angel and say, Oh, look how cute he is. I'm not being facetious. Do we understand that this is... I want you to see, when, when this angel speaks to him and says, Your prayers have been heard, I thank God that our prayers are heard by the Lord. Church, anytime you have felt as though God is, my prayers aren't being answered, God is not hearing my prayers. Church, is God's ear deaf? When, since when has he gone deaf? Is, is his arm shortened that he cannot save? No. Is, my, my prayers are, are bouncing off the ceiling. They're, they're not even getting through the ceiling. Since when have we needed to get our, our prayers into some kind of a rocket launcher to get it through the ceiling? God is with us. Praise His name. Your prayers have been heard and the Lord is going to give you a son and your wife is going to become pregnant. You're going to call His name John. You'll be full of joy and gladness. Many will rejoice. He's going to be great before the Lord and He will not drink wine or strong drink and He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from His mother's womb. He's going to turn many of the children, children of Israel to the Lord their God and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. In other words, this is not possible. I want you to notice what Gabriel's response is. Now, you know what it's like in text. We can't, we can't infer tone from the text. But here's what my ears hear. This is the way my ears hear it. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I don't think he's trying to reason. Listen, listen, Zechariah. Uh, you know, I'm Gabriel, and I stand in God's presence. There is an authority here. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And then this same angel, Gabriel, brings news to Mary that she's going to become the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. He says the same thing to her, don't be afraid. This is the same angel that appeared to, to Daniel. Now here is a multitude of them singing glory to God in the highest.
on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Peter will tell us in his first letter, in chapter 1 and verse 12, after speaking about the fact that prophets have spoken about the coming of Jesus and they didn't understand all that they said and, and said that regarding these things, even angels long to look into them. The word there is the meaning of to bend low. To bend low. You get a picture of them serving, of worshiping. It, it's not like they're, they're in heaven looking down and saying, I don't understand what's going on. I think they understand very well what was going on. And because of it, they were celebrating the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. It, church, how great this declaration was that the, the canopy that separates the invisible from the visible. There are heavenly angels, heavenly beings around us. There are, are worldly, wicked beings all around us. But there's a veil. We can't just, we can't just look and see them. But church, this, this news, this, this act was so phenomenal that this veil, this canopy, whatever it is that separates the two from being seen, that it could not hold them back. It's like, oh, glory to God! <laughs> this is such good news. Good news of great joy. The writer of Hebrews will tell us in chapter 2 of that book that, that he, Jesus, the captain of our salvation, took on flesh to become one of us, to destroy the power of him who held the power of death or fear of death all of our lives. We had this fear of death, but Jesus came. And it says, it says that it's not angels that he came to save. Not one angel that rebelled against the Lord has, has experienced or will have the opportunity to experience salvation. When they sinned against God, when they rebelled against God, it was in the presence of perfection, knowing full well what they were doing. When they sinned and rebelled, their fate was sealed. When those angels remained with their allegiance to God, their, their fate, their, their destiny was sealed from that moment on. Jesus would say in Luke chapter 10, when he began his ministry, he tells his disciples, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you, to you, but rather rejoice what? Rejoice! There's good news. Rejoice in this. What do we rejoice in? Your names are written in heaven. Rejoice in this. He didn't come to save the angels. And the angels are rejoicing, knowing full well that this is God's plan of redemption. That once they were created, God would share with them and say, listen, I've got this plan. I'm going to create this universe. And I'm going to create mankind. And he would, he would tell them what would happen. And, and when he says, listen, they're going to sin against me, you, I, I'm certain you could hear an audible, <gasps> unthinkable. Unthinkable. But God continues and says, I will cast them out of my presence in the Garden of Eden, but my desire is to be with them, to dwell with them. So I will not cast them off forever. I will give them a promise. The promise is myself. And I'm going to come. And I'm going to become one of them. And they, they as yet don't know what a man is. 
just the concept of it. I don't know if God can, can show this is the concept and they could visualize it. I don't know what, how things work in heaven, but they don't know what a man is yet, but they know that it's a being that, has, that, that is able to obey and rebel, to love and to hate. And God says, I'm going to become one of them, lower than you. He's, he's, these angel, these men, these, these, this humanity, they're lower than you angels. And I'm going to become one of them. How great is the love of God. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy. For under you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. <laughs> this is good news of great joy. And I know because I've, I've spent years with you all looking across this room, months to years and I know, you, I know your hearts. I know where you, I don't know everything about you. But I do not know everything about you, but I do know this. I know looking across the faces that you love Jesus. Because of what he's done for us, that's worth celebrating. And if you're watching this or listening to this and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, he went to extraordinary lengths. Extraordinary lengths. as you have just heard, to rescue you from your sin, from your death, from your despair, from your destiny of separation from Him if you don't know Jesus. Angels would minister to Jesus throughout His lifetime. He even said at His arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, put away the sword. Don't you know? Scriptures have to be fulfilled here. Furthermore, and Scriptures, that means my word. I made a promise this is my word. You can look it up. I made, a, I made a promise, and so that my word can be fulfilled, put away your sword. Don't you realize that if I wanted to, I could call on my Father for 12 legions of angels to come and help me. Those same angels, at the declaration of His birth, just beyond that canopy, I'm sure they're just ready. They're ready for the word. Now, they know they don't need to go because they know the plan, but they're ready to do whatever the Lord tells them to do at a moment's notice. But he doesn't call on them because he's determined to offer his life in our place, to take our guilt for the sin we have, we have committed. So that there's not a person on the planet from Adam to the last person that is born with the exception of Jesus Christ, that is able to say, I'm without sin. Not one. And because of that, we've call, fallen short of God's glory. But His purpose and His plan all along was to come. To give His life on that cross as a sacrifice for our sins that God would accept his life instead of ours. That whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That's the ones upon whom his favor rests, those who say, I believe on the one whom you sent, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the commander of the hosts of heaven. The same Jesus who ascended into heaven 40 days after his resurrection, who will come in the same way? Who's coming in the same way? <laughs> and he's going to rule as King of kings and Lord of lords, and the angels will be with him. Prior to that, seven years before that, that could be today. The trumpet of God is going to sound, the voice of the archangel. Come up here! <laughs> Meet your bridegroom. And do you know the picture of what's going on in heaven right now? And this is how we're going to end. Can we join with the angels 
in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. This is the description of the throne room of God. Can we stand together? Jesus is, is, is in the center. Between the throne in verse 6 and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. That's the Father. So the Lamb is Jesus, the sacrifice for our sins. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then John, the writer here, who has this vision, he says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many what? Many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. In other words, an innumerable number. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is Christ Jesus our Lord. At the beginning, I said the title of my message is Jesus, Lord at, dot, dot, dot. It's not just his birth. And it's not just his death. And it's not just his resurrection. It's not just his ascension. And it's not just in his return. It's not just in his rule and reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. It's Jesus, Lord at every aspect of our lives. Whatever we may experience that we turn to Him and say, Lord, I don't know what to do here. I don't have the strategy. I don't have the answer. But You are. You are Lord. So take my fear. My doubts. My hurts. My propensity to try to figure it out myself. Because You are Lord at my present situation. You're Lord in my darkness. You're Lord in my joys. You're Lord in my lack. You're, you're Lord in my abundance. Can we celebrate the Lord? Lord, we bless and honor you. I thank you that you are Lord. We magnify you, Jesus. Open the eyes of our heart that we may see your greatness, your majesty. You're more than a story. You're more than a feeling. You are life and breath itself. Thank you for the hope that you give, the love that you've poured out, filled our hearts. I thank you that you are Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Help me, Jesus, to as so we sang at the beginning, to place you in the highest place. 
in every consideration, every experience of our lives, no matter what it looks like, no matter what the outcome feels like it's going to be, Lord, may it be all to Jesus, all to you, all about you. For, for, for from you and through you and to you are all things. To you be the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.